All right, well, why don't we get, we get started with introductions? I'm Dr. Kathy Troisi. I am here at UT Health Houston School of Public Health. Um, I'm on the faculty and also involved with the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute, which is bringing you today's grand rounds. Um, check us out. We actually, I think you had to go to our website to sign up for this webinar. But just to remind you, it's tephi, T E P H I dot Texas dot gov. Um, you will find newsletters you can sign up for, our certificate course, um, and just general information about preparedness um, in the state of Texas. Uh, I am delighted to have with us today uh, Dr. Amanda Kiefer. She's the zoonosis control veterinarian for the Texas Department of State Health Services in Public Health Region 8. She obtained her doctorate of veterinary medicine from Iowa State University, along with her master's of public health from the University of Iowa. And then she served as army veterinarian for five years and in 2013 achieved the status as a di diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Medicine. She worked as an instructor and program director for the Blinn Veterinary Technology Program in College Station from 2015 to 2017, and then joined the Texas Department of State Health Services in 2018. She currently lives in San Antonio with her husband, Adam, their four children, and like any good veterinarian, a menagerie of animals. And she's gonna be speaking to us today about vector-borne diseases in Texas, um, a timely topic as we enter mosquito season. So doc, oh, and uh, I think Dana just, pat. Uh, posted this, but if you have questions, we'll take them at the end and uh, put them in the question and answer box. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm glad to be here today. I appreciate the invite and uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. So hopefully we can get through it all. And I look forward to your questions and feedback. So this is just a, an intro slide here to show you that we do have a lot of vectors in Texas. This is not all inclusive of the vectors. And these vectors transmit a lot of diseases. We're definitely not gonna have time to cover all of these diseases today, but it's just try, trying to give you a snapshot of how vast uh, the concept of vector-borne diseases can be. So we are gonna talk about vector-borne disease and how it relates to One Health concepts. I'm going to do some specific disease highlights on mosquito-borne and tick-borne diseases, as well as Chagas disease and flea-borne typhus. And throughout, I'm going to discuss the importance of surveillance and why it matters. So to start, let's define vector-borne disease. A vector-borne disease is a disease caused by either a parasite, virus, or bacteria, or other pathogen that's transmitted by an infected arthropod or insect, such as mosquito, tick, sandfly, paratamine, flea, et cetera. In order for there to be transition, there has to be an intersection of that pathogen with the vector that transmits it to the host. Kind of like your epidemiologic triad. The World Health Organization has developed a global vector control response strategy, recognizing that vector-borne disease is a huge burden uh, worldwide. And this slide is some capturings of that response guide. You can see other than the vectors I'm talking about today, there are numerous other vectors and many, many more diseases. About 80% of the world's population is considered to be at risk for one or more vector-borne disease. And 17% of the global burden of communicable disease is due to vector-borne diseases. Mortality is also a burden with vector-borne disease with over 700,000 deaths caused annually by vector-borne disease. And so the ultimate aim of the World Health Organizations and other public health entities is to reduce the burden and threat of vector-borne disease through sustainable vector control options. And we can't talk about vector-borne disease without talking about One Health. One Health is not a new concept, but has become more important in the recent years because many factors have changed how people, animals, plants, and the environment interact. And so especially with vector-borne diseases, uh, climate and ecology plays a huge role in the expansion of those vector species into new habitats, as well as extension of their transmission and reproductive seasons. The movement of humans and the settlement, travel and trade of humans into those habitats increases the risk that we have with those species 
and sometimes new species. Environmental risks and the socioeconomic determinants of health, such as lack of access to clean air, safe water, sufficient food, and secure shelter, also increase the risk of exposure to vector-borne disease. And the domestic animals in our human environment, both our pets and other animals, serve as intermediate hosts from vector-borne disease to humans. And so that intersection also plays a huge factor. So let's take a look at some of the case counts of vector-borne disease in Texas. Keep in mind, this chart is not all inclusive. I just try to hit some highlights and it is broken down by vector groups between mosquitoes, ticks, and other. And you can see here that among the mosquito-borne disease, West Nile virus causes the highest number of cases. Dengue is a close second, but it is important to note that the majority of those cases are travel associated from endemic areas, whereas West Nile virus is considered endemic in Texas. Among tick-borne diseases, we can see the Lyme disease and spotted fever group rickettsiosis, previously recommended spotted fever, account for the majority of tick-borne diseases. I do wanna also emphasize here that while we do get sporadic cases of Lyme disease, Texas is not a high incident state for Lyme disease. And we'll get into that when I cover Lyme disease a little bit later. And then lastly, among other vector-borne disease, we have Chagas disease and flea-borne typhus. Looking at all of these together, you can see that typhus is in fact, flea-borne typhus is in fact the most common that reported vector-borne disease in Texas. And just kind of looking at all of that in a lovely little chart form. So we have mosquito. Uh, so this is showing the count of vector-borne disease cases in Texas by vector type over the past 12-ish years. And we have uh, mosquito-borne with West Nile predominating, tick-borne, kind of a tie between spotted fever and Lyme disease. And then among the other, flea-borne typhus kind of leads the way. So getting into mosquito-borne diseases, I do wanna start with just a quick distinction between uh, floodwater mosquitoes and vector mosquitoes. So for our preparedness folks out there, disaster response folks, uh, floodwater mosquitoes are considered not to provide a public health risk in that they don't carry disease. However, they do impede recovery efforts because they are a nuisance. And so after a flooding event, you're more likely to have these nuisance mosquitoes predominate because after rain or flooding, the eggs are flushed out of soil and stimulated to hatch. So these mosquitoes after a flooding event are the first mosquitoes to show up within days to weeks after that initial, again, water accumulation or rainfall. Uh, they do not lay eggs in standing water. Compared to vector mosquitoes, our disease carrying mosquitoes, that transmit diseases such as West Nile, Zika, chikungunya, dengue, they're not likely to increase immediately after a flooding event, but they do lay eggs in that stagnant water. So following a disaster response, there should be efforts to contain source reduction and remove standing water so that those mosquitoes can't come along after the fact and increase their habitats and um, transmission. So you would see these uh, two weeks to two months following a severe weather event, and the, their life cycle continues as long as that stagnant water remains available. So getting into those vector-borne uh, arboviruses, mosquito-borne diseases are called arboviruses, and that is, they're defined as diseases transmitted, viruses transmitted by arthropods, so it's in the name arbovirus. Arboviruses cause illness in humans. Uh, illnesses can range in severity from acute and benign to mild or severe. So you will have a range of symptoms depending on the disease. Arboviruses can be transmitted and maintained in four different transmission cycles, namely the sylvatic, urban, epizootic, and zoonotic cycles. So the sylvatic cycle in the middle is when viruses are transmitted and maintained in their natural hosts, such as birds, non-human primates, and other mammals. These sylvatic or wild cycles are usually located in human uninhabited or forested areas. So with little exposure to human uh, contact. What happens with urban cycle is spillover occurs because now humans are either entering into that uninhabited area or the vector is moving into the human area. And we have a spillover where those naive human populations become infected. The humans are typically, in this case, what's called a dead-end host, so they don't serve as additional infection to later hosts. 
many uh, virus infections are transmitted by the bite of the mosquito, but if you have infected animals and infected humans, that's how new mosquitoes can pick up the infection and then transmit it from there, which is how epidemics are caused. Then we have the epizootic cycle on the right, which is uh, pathogenic arboviruses among animals, uh, domestic animals such as pigs, horses, et cetera. And when those epidemics occur in animals, eventually we can have the zoonotic cycle where handlers of those animals, or again, mosquitoes that parasitize those animals can then infect humans. So it is kind of a complex cycle of transmission, but you can see there's multiple ways that one health and environment plays a factor here and our um, contact with those animals can result in infection. When talking about arbovirus transmission, you've already heard me use some of these terms. We have to consider the different vector and host relationships. So we typically talk about amplifying hosts or reservoir hosts, which are the host animal where the virus multiplies and serves as the source of infection to new mosquito vectors. Then we have bridge vectors, which incidentally maybe uh, pick up the infection from the amplifying host, but then become a bridge to bring that infection to the dead end host, which would be the animal or human. And the dead end host is that infected host that does not typically have enough virus to transmit it to other vectors. That's why they're called a dead end host. So arboviral activity in Texas is usually limited, uh, but to certain ones, like we already talked about, West Nile is most common. Uh, we do see St. Louis, Eastern equine, uh, uh, dengue, and sporadic cases of other diseases. Since the mosquito vector species for each of these diseases does exist in Texas, though, the potential always exists. And I do want to make just a small note since malaria is listed here. Uh, malaria is considered eradicated in the United States. So when we do see cases of malaria, they're typically travel associated or imported. But again, the Anopheles mosquito does live here. And so this is not an all-inclusive list by any means, but I, I picked some of the highlighted uh, vector mosquito species in Texas, where we have Aedes mosquitoes, Culex mosquito, mosquitoes, Culicetta, and Anopheles. And uh, we won't have time to get into too much of the different species, but essentially they all transmit or serve as a bridge vector for various different diseases. Some have a natural host with humans, some have a natural host with birds and humans, and how we intersect with those mosquitoes affects our ability to become infected. When classifying arboviruses, we also distinguish between endemic and emerging or re-emerging arboviruses. So endemic are those that are considered consistently present in our area versus emerging or re-emerging, which are those that are considered travel associated or imported or brought into our area. And so the Texas Department of State Health Services publishes weekly arbovirus activity reports on their website. And you can see a link here on this slide. Uh, this is a screenshot of the final week of 2022. So it's a summary of 2022 data. You can see that the arbovirus activity reports is split between surveillance data on the left with mosquito pools and animal cases, and then human surveillance data, human case data from both uh, infections and positive viremic donors or the PVD on the far right. So we do a lot of surveillance, whether it's through animal, insect, or human, uh, to identify the presence of arboviruses in our state. And you can, again, review these reports on the DSHS website, and they are published weekly. This is the arbovirus activity map for 2022. Note that this map only includes the locally acquired cases, not the travel-associated cases, such as the dengue cases that were shown on the previous uh, slide. But we can and occasionally do have locally acquired dengue cases. The last locally acquired dengue case in Texas were in 2020 in Hidalgo and Webb counties. So getting into some of the diseases specifically, starting with West Nile virus, it was discovered in Uganda in 1937 and arrived, some of you may remember, in the United States in 1999. Its primary vector uh, is the Culex mosquito and primary reservoir are birds. And you can see from this graph by the CDC, uh, case incidence does fluctuate from year to year. Again, that's really dependent on the species abundance, the vector ecology, and other factors. 
uh, but we do tend to see uh, peaks and valleys of West Nile case reports. In the United States, about 1,300 are infected per year, and thankfully death is rare. Prior to 1999, cases and outbreaks were isolated to Africa, Asia, Europe, and Russia. But like I said previously, it is now considered endemic in the Americas. There is no treatment or vaccine for humans. There is a West Nile vaccine for horses. And uh, among human infections, older adults tend to be at highest risk for severe outcomes. So there's typically no symptoms in most people, and then some people will get mild symptoms, fever, fatigue, aches, and rash. And you're going to see fever, fatigue, aches, and rash for almost all vector-borne diseases and certainly zoonotic diseases, kind of fever and rash are the hallmark of those conditions. Uh, but it is it does give you a good clue that there may have been a zoonotic exposure. And then severe outcomes in a few, so in those high-risk individuals, can develop neurologic outcomes of encephalitis and meningitis. In Texas, last year, we had 36 human cases, seven deaths, 12 positive blood, viremic blood donors, 410 positive mosquito pools, 10 positive horses, one positive bird. So again, we do see a lot of West Nile activity every year. And breaking that down into the mosquito surveillance data by week of collection, you can see there is a seasonality to West Nile virus. As Kathy mentioned, we're coming up on that season pretty soon. Uh, so moving into kind of the summer and late or early fall months is when we see peak activity. You can see also here that in 2021, we had a lot higher incidence of positive West Nile virus mosquito pools, positive pools. And those case, those uh, mosquito surveillance data does tend to correlate with human cases. So here's the human cases uh, data for that same period. And that's why, again, surveillance is important, because if we do mosquito surveillance, we can maybe predict the possibility of human outbreaks and target our public health interventions towards those communities. I just want to briefly talk about St. Louis encephalitis virus. Before West Nile virus, it was the most common cause of arboviral disease in the United States. Uh, the primary vectors are Culex mosquito, similar to West Nile and the primary reservoir are birds. For St. Louis encephalitis, less than 1% of the infections are clinically impaired. Again, you're gonna have fever, headache, nausea, maybe fatigue. Again, older age is a risk factor. And then um, the concern with St. Louis encephalitis is that 90% of infected elderly develop, go on to develop encephalitis. It is thankfully rare. You can see here, these case reports are much smaller in comparison to West Nile but it does occur in the United States. And we do have sporadic uh, reports. So in 2022, we had one human case and two positive mosquito pools. The human case was in Harris County and the mosquito pools were in El Paso. Eastern equine encephalitis is transmitted in its sylvatic cycle through the Culeseta mosquito, and then bridge vectors, ADs, and Culex uh, play a role in the transmission to the dead-end hosts of horses and humans. It is also rare in the United States, more often occurring on the Gulf Coast. Horses are the main dead-end host, and 90%, there's a 90% mortality rate of horses that have the encephalitic syndrome. Thankfully, this can also be prevented, though, with vaccination and mosquito control. Uh, as opposed to West Nile and St. Louis, there are more severe outcomes for Eastern equine encephalitis in humans. About 30% of those affected will die, and those who survive end up about 90% with permanent brain damage. So that is definitely a concern. Uh, again, we see higher risk in the older population as well as the younger uh, immuno-naive uh, population. Again, rare, we have not had a reported human case in Texas, but we have had positive uh, mosquito pools and horses. So last year we had one positive horse. Uh, the activity is typically seen in East Texas. In 2021, we had two positive mosquito pools and six positive horses. Uh, so the potential does exist knowing we do have the vector here. And just switching from endemic arboviral diseases to emerging or imported diseases, want to talk about dengue. 
because that's uh, one of the other most common. It is spread by Aedes mosquitoes, and this is a really globally important arboviral disease. About 400 million people are infected per year, and about one in four of those become sick, as well as about 40,000 deaths per year. Dengue virus is kind of unique in that there are four related serotypes or viruses uh, for transmission, and a person can be infected with more than one in their lifetime. And with dengue, the second dengue virus infection you're, you, you get is the most likely to cause severe dengue because your immune system reacts more strongly and that hemorrhagic syndrome is more likely to occur. Like other viral diseases, there is no treatment. There is a vaccine available, but it's limited use because that second exposure causes more severe dengue. The vaccine is only limited to those who have had evidence of a previous infection. Symptoms include, again, your fever, rash, and aches. They typically last about two to seven days, and most people recover in about a week, but about one in uh, 20 will get sick with severe dengue, which consists of shock, internal bleeding, and sometimes death. Again, if you've had dengue in the past, you're more likely to develop the severe dengue. Infants and pregnant women are at higher risk. And we see dengue cases throughout the United States, most often travel associated. Uh, on this map, only Florida and Arizona had locally transmitted cases in 2022. The rest were all, again, imported or travel cases. The last locally transmitted dengue case in, cases in Texas, as I mentioned earlier, were in 2020. And so here's just a map of the 2020 data. So what do we do to prevent these diseases, knowing that there's no specific treatments available? So we have kind of four key points. We can prevent mosquito breeding, protect against mosquito bites, protect against non-vector transmission, and protect against travel exposure. Along with those recommendations for the public, we have integrated pest management to, with insecticides and larvicides. We have surveillance to help establish trends and predict potential outbreaks and then vaccination and prophylaxis where available. So preventing mosquito breeding, there are several described methods and many resources available for this. Some of the standard recommendations are listed here. Essentially, we know that female mosquitoes lay their eggs in and around water habitats. So as I mentioned before, it's a lot about source reduction and removing those habitats. With integrated pest management, you, have, uh, you can prevent breeding or the perpetuation of these species through insecticides, larvicides, and taking action in communities based on, you know, response of uh, population abundance or other concerns or surveillance data. To prevent mosquito bites, patients must basically avoid um, exposure to mosquitoes and or prevent access to the mosquitoes for biting them. So here's some common recommendations staying inside and limiting outdoor activities during peak mosquito times, which tend to be dawn and dusk, wearing approved insect repellents, covering up skin when you have to be outside, uh, treating clothing with permethrin if you're taking part in prolonged outdoor activity. Those are just a few examples. And then we have non-vector transmission. So we've been talking mostly about the transmission from the vector to the host. But we do know that some of these arboviruses can be transmitted in other ways. So we, we know that Zika and Dengue can be transmitted through sexual intercourse. We know that congenital transmission is possible with Zika, Chikungunya, Dengue, and Malaria, so from mother to baby. And then other possible sources can be blood transfusion, organ transplant, and needle stick injuries. So taking steps to prevent transmission in that way is another important way to prevent arboviral disease. I mentioned that there are limited vaccines for arboviruses, so I talked a little bit about the dengue vaccine. It's limited to those with previous infection in endemic areas. There is a yellow fever vaccine for those traveling to um, Africa, South America. I mentioned a West Nile virus vaccine for horses, and it does come in a combination vaccine that it also includes protection against Eastern and Western and sometimes Venezuelan equine encephalitis, so that's definitely recommended here in our area. And then Japanese encephalitis virus is um, vaccine preventable, and this virus occurs mostly in Asian, Asia and Western Pacific. So we do have some vaccines, but 
stopping the mosquito transmission cycle is key. And again, to emphasize importance of surveillance, we've already kind of, I've already kind of mentioned how weather, climate, human activity, vector activity, host activity can all influence the transmission of these diseases and the um, incidence of those hosts and vectors in the environment. So with surveillance, we can inform our integrated mosquito management programs. So doing mosquito surveillance, identifying what mosquitoes are in the area, identifying if they contain those viruses can help lead to providing those public health interventions, whether it is mosquito control, whether it's putting out public service announcements on the risk in the area, reminding people to prevent uh, mosquito breeding and mosquito bites, and then as well as being able to establish trends for your environment, your jurisdiction, so that you can begin to predict when it's time to enact those interventions. A component of any good surveillance program includes looking at the species that you have in your area, the abundance of the population, where in the area it's located, what time of year they're most predominant, which species carry which arboviruses, and their susceptibility to insecticides. And so you can determine all that data through surveillance with your surveys, your mosquito collection and identification, as well as pathogen testing and insecticide resistance testing. And the great news is that the DSHS Arbovirus Entomology Laboratory does provide these services. So they do mosquito species identification year round, testing for arboviruses May through November, and insecticide resistance testing year round. So if you are interested, you can become a submitter to the Arbovirus Lab. It's typically health departments, mosquito control or public work districts, universities, military uh, that submit. And we'd be happy to help get you set up so you can contact your regional zoonosis control uh, for information on that. Essentially, mosquitoes or and or their larvae are collected, they're placed into proper shipping containers, and then they're shipped to the lab and they will provide you with that information within a several week turnaround time. And with that, you can then use that data to make a response plan based on the tools that you have, knowing what species you have, what products are best for those species, whether they're resistant to the insecticide you're currently using, and you can continue add that to your integrated mosquito management plan and hopefully prevent these diseases. So that was a lot to cover on mosquito, but we still have more to go. So I'm gonna get into tick-borne disease. We have a lot of ticks, just like we have a lot of mosquitoes and ticks can transmit a lot of diseases too. Again, we're not gonna have time to go through all of these diseases. I'm gonna hit some highlights. Uh, but this slide is just to show you that we have both hard and soft ticks and lots of different uh, ways that vectors can these tick vectors can transmit disease or opportunities. In general, uh, tick-borne disease diagnosis can be challenging. So sometimes uh, clinicians will base their diagnosis on symptoms and history because it might take time to get testing results before uh, you, you get your diagnosis and you can start treatment. So usually, again, fever and rash are kind of the hallmark of some of these diseases, along with a travel or exposure history. There is laboratory testing. You can do PCR or serology. And also if the tick is captured, the tick can be sent for testing to DSHS. Uh, we have a partnership with the University of North Texas Health Science Center, the Tick-Borne Research Laboratory. And just to keep in mind, and I'll mention it again, that while we can they can test the ticks for pathogens, it's not an indication necessarily of diagno diagnosis or lack of diagnosis. So if the symptoms and history match, then the clinician should proceed with the proper treatment. And that treatment in general is doxycycline. It's the drug of choice for presumptive or confirmed tick-borne disease with a significant symptom or exposure history. It's the drug of choice for animals, adults, and children, and delaying in that treatment can lead to worse outcomes. So it is okay if you the clinician has an index of suspicion to start that treatment before the testing results are confirmed because it's most effective given within the first five days of illness and most testing results are not back within that time frame. In general, prevention for tick-borne disease is multifaceted. 
So similar to mosquito borne, you want to prevent those areas where ticks like to uh, inhabit, uh, remove brush piles, remove grass, uh, maintain a barrier between your home and the um, outer areas, keep your gardens clean, keep deer out of your yard. For your animals, you can uh, check them for ticks, but also there are vaccines for Lyme disease in animals, as well as flea and tick preventatives. And then you can prevent tick bites on yourself by also wearing repellent. If you're going to be in woody or areas where ticks are found, make sure you're checking for ticks daily. And of course, if you do develop a fever or rash, to call your doctor right away and let them know of your, your history. If you're going to remove a tick, I have to remind everyone here too that you are not you should not grab it directly with your bare fingertips. You have an increased chance of exposing yourself to the pathogens that way. So use a tool such as tweezers to remove the head, um, remove the tick by its head and pull up firmly and then wash the area. So I already mentioned Lyme disease is, we are not a high incidence state for Lyme disease, but we do get a lot of questions about Lyme. So I'm gonna go through that. The causative agent is a bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, and the primary vector are Exodes ticks or deer's ticks. The reservoir species are small mammals, deer, and birds. <clears throat> and so the primary risk factors for lip, uh, Lyme disease are having recreational activities in those type of tick habitats or travel to an endemic area. For Lyme disease, the tick has to be attached for a long period of time, usually about 36 hours, uh, to transmit the pathogen. So Lyme disease is the most commonly reported vector-borne disease in the United States, but it's geographically focal. So the majority of cases occur in Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Upper Midwest regions, as shown here. And we just have sporadic cases compared to those regions. In humans, uh, symptoms can include a bullseye rash in about 70 to 80% of infected persons. That rash is also known as erythema migrans or EM. It begins at the site of the tick bite about seven days after exposure, and it can vary in size and appearance. It doesn't always look like a classic bullseye, uh, but if the rash or target area is greater than five centimeters, it can be considered as part of the diagnosis. And then other acute symptoms can include fever, fatigue, and sometimes uh, facial palsies and joint swelling. Moving on to spotted fever rickettsiosis, which is caused by rickettsia rickettsii and transmitted by dermacentaur ticks and the rupicephalus sanguineus brown dog tick. Primary reservoir is small animals. The, again, a tick has to be uh, attached for a certain length of time to transmit the bacteria. Uh, the way rickettsia bacteria cause disease or damage is they replicate along the blood vessels and then uh, causes damage. So that's why you tend to see those kind of pinpoint hemorrhages or little rashes, uh, which would occur within three to 12 days after exposure. Uh, spotted fever rickettsiosis cases are reported throughout the United States, uh, but five states account for over 50% of those cases, which are Arkansas, Missouri, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. And they tend to see communities with large numbers of free roaming dogs as uh, the primary sites of exposure because the primary, the dog tick is responsible. Symptoms, again, fever, headache, rash. The rash for spotted fever uh, tends to start on the extremities in about 90% of cases. And then other uh, symptoms, as well as uh, thrombocytopenia, which is low platelets and elevated liver enzymes. Without treatment, it can progress to late stage illness, which includes altered mental status, respiratory distress, and multi organ system damage. So, this is where that uh, prompt treatment with a suspicion of tick borne disease um, can help prevent those severe outcomes. Similar to spotted fever rickettsiosis, we have rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis, which is a tongue twister. Uh, it's very similar, but it is a milder condition. Uh, one unique feature is the rash is different, or there is no rash, but there is an inoculation eschar, which looks kind of like a dark colored scab with redness, as shown in the uh, picture here on the right. It is spread by the Gulf Coast tick, and the reason I'm just bringing this up is it's Commercial testing for this condition is not readily available, 
and uh, spotted fever antibody tests tend to cross react with rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis. So if you have a suspicion, uh, you can request additional laboratory testing through DSHS to determine if you have a rickettsia parkeri case versus a uh, spotted fever case. And again, don't delay antibiotic therapy regardless, especially if you're considering uh, tick-borne disease. Then we have tick-borne relapsing fever, which is caused by Borrelia species, and this is a diff different Borrelia species that, than Lyme, and the, this is unique in that it's transmitted by the soft ticks, the Ornithodorus ticks, and soft ticks are unique because they don't require a long time to feed. They can uh, just be attached for a short period of time, fall off, and do their thing, and then, you know, transmit that bacteria. Uh, the known risk factors for tick-borne relapsing fever, where we've seen sporadic outbreaks, have been among people who sleep in rustic cabins and activities in and around forest caves and burrows, because this is where those ticks tend to reside. It's called tick-borne relapsing fever because it does just that. It's a fever that kind of comes and goes and relapses after a period of days. And so you'll see that recurring cycle of symptoms of, you know, Three days fever, seven days no fever. Three days fever, seven days no fever. Getting into uh, tick surveillance. So I mentioned the uh, Zoonosis Control Partners with the UNT Health Science Center to test ticks. And right now they're testing for Borrelia, Ehrlichia, and Rickettsia species. And you can request additional testing for other species if, if you have a suspicion for, for that and it does incur an extra fee. To collect the ticks, remove them with a safe method, uh, place it in a suitable container. You do not need to preserve them in alcohol, formalin, or saline, which would probably also get you in trouble trying to ship uh, through the postal service. So just put them in a suitable container that's sealed, fill out a tick submission form, and ship properly to Zoonosis Control. You can find the tick submission form on our website. And then those ticks will be identified for species, stage of development, and then on to pathogenic testing. And if you have a, uh, no matter the result, positive or negative, your Zoonosis Control Office will notify you of the result. And remember, it's for tick surveillance, not di diagnosis. Uh, having a tick with the organism does not necessarily mean transmission occurred. And also having a tick that tests negative does not mean that there is no infection. It's just telling you information about that tick at that particular time. But it is useful information. And so here are pathogens that have been detected in Texas ticks submitted uh, to the lab. So we've had Ehrlichia, Rickettsia, Parkeri, Borrelia burgdorferi, and uh, across multiple counties in Texas. And for you uh, tick enthusiasts out there, they are hoping to switch to a new digital PCR methodology this year, later this year, which will include multiplex panels, which will include additional pathogens listed here, as well as these pathogens listed here. So uh, all ticks ideally will be uh, tested with all panels and you'll get some more surveillance data that way. So again, if you're into ticks, again, contact your Zoonosis Control or the uh, Health Science Center for more information. Okay, getting into flea-borne diseases, specifically flea-borne typhus or murine typhus. It's caused by a rickettsia bacteria, rickettsia typhi, and possibly rickettsia felis. The vector is flea, that's hence the name. And that these are primary rat fleas or cat fleas. So the reservoir animals that carry those fleas that tend to serve as kind of an intermediate um, host to animals are rats, opossums, cats, and other small mammals. So the transmission is through the flea feces or saliva that has the bacteria and that uh, humans become infected by either being bit by fleas and then scratching that feces and saliva into the bite or rubbing their hands into mucous membranes like mouth, nose, or eyes. Also, we have seen cases from inhalation of dried, what's called uh, dirt, rat or, or cat flea dirt. Uh, so in places where those animals are residing or have resided and there's flea feces and dirt in the environment as you maybe go clean out that dusty barn and that dust comes up and you inhale it, that is another mode of transmission. So good to wear PPE if you're going to be in an environment like that where there may have been rodents or cats. Symptoms will occur within 6 to 14 days after exposure. Again, most often fever and rash. 
the other, the unique thing about the rash here is that it tends to start in the trunk as opposed to the extremities. So starts on the trunk and then spreads to the arms and legs. And then uh, elevated liver enzymes, I would say, are the next most classic indication of uh, infection along with some of the other symptoms you see here. Typhus associated deaths are rare, but uh, prompt treatment again is ideal to prevent those infections. And those severe outcomes are in about less than 5%. Typhus cases in Texas occur year round, but peak between the uh, May to July and December to January. And most cases occur in, along the uh, Rio Grande Valley. Is since 2008 to 2019, we've had about 4,000 cases, and 25% of those cases were reported among those between 6 to 15 years of age. So you can imagine those individuals are out in those habitats and possibly interacting with those uh, reservoir animals. I just before this presentation, I realized I didn't have a lot on police surveillance, but I did uh, pull up a few studies here in Texas. So UTMB Galveston and Sam Houston State have done some recent study on rickettsia pathogens. Uh, UTMB Galveston did a study, uh, surveillance of fleas found on opossums and then one on feral cats. And they did find evidence of rickettsia typhi in those fleas, but they also found uh, rickettsia felis. And the same with Sam Houston State, they found rickettsia felis in fleas of various companion animals, dogs and cats. So. I don't think it's a secret that those animals carry fleas, and if we are around those animals, we are uh, at risk for developing uh, murine typhus or flea-borne typhus. As far as healthcare recommendations, we have seen increasing typhus cases since 2017, and so we do like to advise healthcare providers to always increase their suspicion with if you have a patient presenting with a fever and rash, as well as those uh, other symptoms and elevated liver enzymes. Uh, as I mentioned at the way beginning, we do tend to see mostly among vector-borne diseases, flea-borne typhus. And so uh, when in doubt, you know, consider that as a differential. And again, prompt uh, treatment can help prevent severe outcomes. So providing that doxycycline as soon as you have that index of suspicion can, can help. There is no vaccine for flea-borne typhus. Ideally, avoid contact with fleas. So don't feed or pet stray or wild animals. I know some of you out there are guilty of this. Almost every person I talk to with this, this disease says, well, yeah, I did pick up these kittens, but they were cute and covered in fleas and I gave them a bath or, you know, I, I fed the opossums or whatever they're doing. So avoid doing that. Wear gloves if you are going to handle sick or dead animals and use insect repellents when working outside, especially in grassy areas. Keep your pets on flea control and tick control. And, and find ways to keep rodents and other wild animals away from your environment. environment. So seal up entry points around the home, remove possible nesting areas, and keep lids on your food, compost, and trash containers. Okay, last but certainly not least, Chagas disease. So take a good look. You've probably seen these bugs in and around the uh, Texas, south, south, southern Texas, but they occur all over um, south, southern United States. So the uh, Chagas disease is caused by a protozoan parasite known as Trypanosoma cruzi which is shed in the feces of triatamine bugs. And triatamine bugs are also known as kissing bugs, reduvid bugs, cone nose bugs, assassin bugs, and chinches. And from studies, we, we know that about 50 to 60% of bugs in the United States carry the T. cruzi organism, which transmits Chagas disease. It is considered endemic in the Americas. Uh, an estimated 8 million people are infected in Mexico, Central and South America, and about 300,000 per persons in the United States. As I mentioned, it's transmitted through the feces of the kissing bug. So an infected uh, bug might defecate during feeding, or there might be fe fecal contamination around a wound or mucous membrane like eyes, mouth, uh, nose, and if that feces enters the, the bloodstream in that way, that is how the infection occurs. So it's not the bite, it's the feces. And you can see in this picture here, a, a very full of blood triatamine taking a blood meal, also defecating there in the middle picture. And then if that individual were to notice that and then scratch the wound uh, without washing it first, then they might uh, transmit that feces, infected feces into the wound and thereby get infected. Other methods of transmission can be mother to baby, so congenital, 
contaminated blood products, such as through transfusions, uh, organ donors, laboratory accidents like needle sticks, and contaminated food or drink. And there are cases in uh, the Southern Americas of unpasteurized drinks, especially acai berry, I think is coming up as a high risk uh, product. So unpasteurized products where the bug may have defecated or contaminated the product. This is the life cycle of the uh, Trypanosoma cruzi. So the vector, the bug, will pick up the uh, T. cruzi organism from the bloodstream of an infected person or animal, and then it replicates inside the, the bug and ultimately goes through a life stage to where when the uh, bug then feeds on the next host or person, those organisms invade the host cells and they start to replicate and reproduce. And while they're replicating and reproducing through their life cycle, they cause tissue damage. And that is the hallmark of Chagas disease is the tissue damage that occurs many years later after initial exposure and typically involves heart or GI system damage. So we have acute and chronic phases of this disease. The acute phase is often asymptomatic or mild or no, or no symptoms or nonspecific symptoms, just like your fever and rash. Maybe most people just think they have a bug bite. Uh, the local swelling where the parasite enters the body is characterized as a shagoma. So it's that it's kind of, again, it looks like a bug bite with a swelling. And then one hallmark of acute Chagas disease would be the Romagna sign, which is shown in the bottom right, which is a swelling of the eyelids on the side of the face uh, where the either bite or feces were rubbed into the eye. So it's kind of like a swelling, uh, a reaction, an, an immune reaction to the exposure. Rarely you will have acute uh, events such as myocarditis, encephalitis, or pneumonitis. Most often symptoms are going to resolve on their own with the person not ever even knowing they were exposed. But what's concerning with Chagas disease is the chronic phase. So it can go between what's called the chronic indeterminate or the chronic symptomatic phase. So the indeterminate phase is a latent infection where 70 to 80% of people just remain asymptomatic their whole life while carrying the organism, whereas chronic symptomatic phase is where those latent infections progress to a symptomatic infection. So at this point, the organism has caused enough damage to result in complications, and those complications usually are heart disease or GI disease. So with heart disease, you're going to see cardiomyopathies, heart failure, uh, arrhythmias, and cardiac arrest. And with GI disease, you'll see mega esophagus or mega colon, mega colon. But the mega uh, syndromes are more rare, only about 10% of cases. So by and large, you're seeing the heart complications. Diagnosis can be challenging. So again, if in the acute phase, if you don't know you've been exposed, uh, you know, you might not have had the opportunity to get a blood smear. And, and you can only really detect the circulating organism in a, in a blood smear in the first eight weeks after exposure. And even then, a single blood smear might not find the organism you're looking for. So we don't routinely recommend blood smears, uh, but we do recommend serology. So uh, serology will look at the level of antibodies in the, of the organism in the blood. And if those are positive, then we would follow that up with a confirmatory test or PCR test which detects the DNA of the organism in blood tissue. And so when you have a confirmation, then treatment would be recommended depending on your age and symptoms. And the zoonosis control programs can help you determine uh, the best steps for laboratory diagnosis. And the DSHS lab also does now offer T. cruzi serology, IgG. If you have a confirmed diagnosis, uh, follow-up should include a medical history, physical exam, and ECG and following those results and treatment may be indicated. Treatment is antiparasitic medication and uh, it's always recommended for acute congenital infections as well as patients without advanced disease. If the patient has advanced disease or is older in age, the antiparasitic medications are not going to stop the damage that's already been done. So in lieu of the complications that the antiparasitic medications can cause, it's sometimes it's recommended for no treatment and just um, management of the clinical symptoms. We have Chagas disease in Texas. We have uh, locally acquired cases. We have positive triatamines. We've had positive animals. So this disease is definitely here. And if you haven't been exposed or seen or heard about it yet, you probably will. And if you do, you can always give us a call. Uh, Texas does have one of the highest number of diversity of 
tritamine species. So in that very first picture, I showed all the species across the top of the slide. Uh, so you can see Texas has a, a high number of species, but in gray here are states that have reported at least one species. So while most people think it is only a disease of the um, South America, it's obviously here in the United States and we do have the kissing bug vector here. The word autochthonous is always fun to say. These are cases in the U.S. that are considered locally transmitted or people who were not born or had traveled to an endemic area. And there was a recent study in 2020 uh, about looking back at the case reports of confirmed or suspected locally transmitted cases in the United States. And they did find some common risk factors among those cases. And the highest common risk factors were having rural residents in your lifetime, a history of hunting or camping, history of agriculture or outdoor employment, or a lifetime sighting of the vector or knowledge of the vector. We can also test triatamines for surveillance. So if you have a bug found in your home or has bitten a human, DSHS can provide testing and the CDC can uh, do a pathogen test as well as whether it's taken a human blood meal. So that can help it guide your treatment or diagnosis. And if you have a bug found outside of the home, you can also submit it to the uh, Texas A&M University Kissing Bug Citizen Science Program. And I can see I'm getting short on time. I wanna have enough time for questions. I'm just gonna quick highlight that we do know that animals can have T. cruzi, the kissing bug. Uh, Community Science Program has a lot of great publications and resources. I put the link here, but they have shown zero prevalence in multiple um, mammalian species to T. cruzi, from dogs to bats. And dogs can get Chagas disease. We do get case reports of dogs uh, with this condition. They tend to eat the bugs instead of having the mucous membrane or um, bite exposures. And outdoor dogs and working dogs are at highest risk. To prevent kissing bugs, you need to prevent their nesting or bedding sites. They're essentially looking for a blood meal. So remove those uh, host reservoir animals or any poorly sealed walls or cracks in and around your home. If you have uh, outdoor pets, keep them in at night or in an enclosed sealed space so that bugs cannot come up you know, onto that porch or into that kennel to, to uh, expose them. Examine your pet's bedding for kissing bugs. Keep lights off at night and re reduce that outdoor debris. So similar to fleas and ticks as well. You want to reduce the source habitat. There are no licensed or approved uh, insecticide products for kissing bugs in the United States, but synthetic pyrethroid sprays are used in South America. And uh, we do know or have seen that bait formulations don't tend to be successful because the bug is not really looking for a specific bait. They're looking for a breathing, warm body to do a blood meal on. So in summary, uh, vectors are found throughout Texas, disease vectors, and can transmit many diseases to both humans and animals. Both endemic and emerging vector-borne diseases occur in Texas, and there are multiple strategies to reduce disease, namely surveillance and testing of those vectors, integrated pest management, testing and reporting, and then control of our animal populations. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Bethany Bowling and Bonnie Mays for their assistance with the data and slides in this presentation, as well as Teffy for giving me the platform to talk with you all today. Here are some additional resources for you. And my next few slides have some references. So I'll show those up while we answer some questions, if there's still time. All right, thank you so much for this comprehensive um, overview of vector-borne diseases in Texas. I'm um, sort of surprised we don't see more disease given all these vectors we have. Um, there are, uh, uh, well, one question in the chat um, from Laura Pawanka. Do you know if Texas or other states were, will ever genetically modify, modify mosquitoes like Florida did? Uh, I do not know if they will, but I don't see why not. There's a lot of uh, vector control programs that are looking for new and novel ways to prevent mosquito-borne, especially transmission. And another question from Jane Shin Gunther, who, commercial, makes the DPCR tick pathogens panel? I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that question, but I can find out. <laughs> All right. Jane, um, I think you have um, 
Dr. Kiefer's contact information, maybe you can contact her directly or you can find her on the um, DISH's website. Uh, I had a question for you. You mentioned about the increase in typhus um, since 2017. I know this was the subject of an MMWR report, uh, but what are the reasons that we're seeing this? Do we know? Well, it's kind of multifold. It could be that it's it's been here and knowing that doxycycline is kind of this treatment of choice for both tick and other vector-borne diseases, it could be that with more awareness, there's been more surveillance or more testing. Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes it, you know, but also just in general, you know, people are, we have those stray animal habitats. People are in more uh, contact with those animals. And if you're gonna be in and around those flea environments, you're gonna uh, have exposures. Great, and let me see if there's, oh, are arboviruses shed in stool? Uh, the stool of the I'm a, dead end I, I host, am, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I'm, but, I'm guessing this relates to wastewater surveillance, so oh, uh, human stool. I also don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> it may very well depend on the pathogen as well. Yeah. And um, there were a couple questions about the slides. Um, this will be posted to YouTube shortly and you will get, um, since you're registered, you will all get a notice that that's been done. Uh, and one last question, if it's not too long an answer, um, you mentioned how we don't have vaccines against most of these arboviruses. Is that because it's not commercially feasible to develop vaccines or is there some immunologic property that makes developing an effective vaccine difficult? I don't think it's an immu immunological property. Um, you know, for example, we have the uh, vaccine for horses and it, it may just be that uh, the exposure risk is kind of unknown and varies from season to season that it's not enough of an incidence to have it as like a recommended vaccine in our area since it's just an endemic virus, um, as opposed to those vaccines for travel associated areas. I think that's probably the main reason there's not mm -hmm. enough of a demand uh, for it in humans. But it doesn't mean people aren't working on developing it. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning about our upcoming grand rounds. Uh, I am arranging for one on avian influenza in May, but I don't have the date yet. And in, um, actually I did say this, didn't I? But it's good to remind you again, uh, June 21st is one on noroviruses. So um, some kudos in the question and answer for you, Dr. Keeper. And thank you so much for joining us today, you and everyone on this webinar. See you uh, in two months. Thank you so much for your time. Bye -bye. Have a great day.